So it's uh, great to have uh, Tatiana uh, Sharfi with us, even though uh, at a distance. And uh, so as I agreed with her that uh, I will uh, be here and uh, I will try to act as a teaching assistant as much as possible. And uh, so then, uh, Tiania, you, you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Matteo, for the invitation and for the opportunity to interact and participate in the Spring College. I also appreciate accommodating my Zoom request. I was a little bit too scared to travel a long distance. So I hope that we can make the best of the um, interactions that are Zoom allowed. So this is the first lecture. Um, and as I understand, it's also the first day for you. Um, so my course will be on um, information maximization and hyperbolic geometry. Sometimes we read from right to left. Um, and um, um, so this is the plan that, um, so these are the textbooks that I recommend. Um, mostly in addition to the papers that um, more recent papers that are not covered by the textbooks. These are the two primary textbooks um, um, on, by Bialik, by Physics Searching for Principles, and David McKay, Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms. And there are others to uh, mention here that you can see um, as uses a reference. So my plan was for these nine lectures is that today I will um, cover my view of uh, why information theory is useful. And um, we will already start exploring connection with hyperbolic geometry. But basically today um, I was planning to go over concept of information theory and how they relate to um, neuroscience specifically. So we will talk about um, entropy in physics and um, in biology, um, the derivation for the Shannon entropy, if um, um, various conditional and relative entropies, mutual information. So it's a two hour, uh, hour and a half lecture. So there's it's basically twice the normal amount that I usually give in a class lecture. And we will talk about the principle of maximum entropy and uh, time allowing maximum noise entropy, and also discuss connection between information and hierarchical systems. So going forward, we can adjust. So you will have these lecture notes. You can um, read over them. We can adjust the plan for um, other lectures as needed, but this is... Um, what I was planning so far for the second lecture, I will talk about information maximization in neural circuits and uh, various limits that are imposed by discretization, by nonlinearities, by filtering. So we will talk about optimality, optimal predictions for linear part of the computation, optimal predictions for nonlinear part of the computation, and um, how we can compare neural responses relative to the optimal uh, predictions based on limited number of observations that can make in neural circuits. So this is lectures one to three. And then <coughs> um, second half will be more about hyperbolic geometry. So we will explore the connection between hierarchical systems and hyperbolic geometry and information. We will talk about information theory in decision-making um, also as it relates to hierarchical systems. We will talk about information theory in uh, search. So some, uh, some of the work actually is done at the CTP. And, um, and then, the last few lectures, I was thinking uh, we will talk about information maximization in recurrent networks. 
And there will be a final concluding lectures to tie it all together. So, so to begin with, so I heard that you just uh, went through the basics of information theory, so we can make it more of a discussion. And um, you can uh, tell me what you know and what would you like to know in uh, this um, um, in this topic. I will provide my own examples, and hopefully they will be um, they will augment what you have heard just now. So examples of information tra uh, transfer is um, radio communication between from Earth to Mars, you know, the, the, the time delay. It's very exciting movies that are coming from uh, Mars and how you have to, those who work on the project have to live on, on the Martian schedule and wait for, uh, synchronized with the delivery of uh, signals. Um, the phone communication, so that was one of the original applications of the information theory during um, transmission uh, and, and encryption. And um, also in neural transmission, so we are biological systems, but we operate in a physical world. And so we have to obey the rules of statistical physics. And um, there are basically two theorems um, that underlie the information theory that I find very useful. One of them is that the one that you discussed recently about the Shannon's um, channel coding theorem, which states that for a given amount of accuracy, colloquially speaking, you need to... Um, invest certain amount of energy. So, and then another one that we will discuss in the second half of the course, it relates to Kelly gambling. So soon after Shannon published his theorem, people ask, so why is the information theory useful? And why is it relevant to biology? So then there was another example, um, soon after a publication by John Kelly, who showed that information determines the maximum rate of growth for a, a set of, um, you can say, portfolio in economics, or um, you can formulate equivalent problems in um, bacterial growth, meaning that the maximum rate of growth in the bacterial population will be limited by how much information it extracts about its environment. And if you think there are two competing uh, populations of bacteria that are competing for resources, the one that extracts more information from its environment has a chance to grow, uh, to outcompete the other population. So th that's some of the examples. And uh, in neural transmission, so we have uh, signals from the environment, and then there are uh, signals in the brain that have to reduce our uncertainty about what's happening in the real world. So, um, and then another example in evolution, so that will be accumulation of information across generation in DNA storage and retrieval. And then another example, which is, I think is not mentioned on this slide, is um, the accumulation of information in, uh, say, cultural knowledge, and um, as in books. So how much, um, and some say that that's the driver for human evolution. So I, are there any questions or comments uh, from here, uh, from the audience? before we go through specific examples. More material before questions can be asked. I cannot hear. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, there are no questions. Uh, 
Okay. As of now, but... Uh, All right. Okay. So I will begin with an example of inference, and it's from um, uh, David McKay's um, textbook. And uh, he goes over the case where um, of uh, inference and um, uh, crime scene investigation. And he says two traces of blood were found, one type O and the other one type AB. So he said, um, given that we know the frequency of various blood types in the population, that AB is fairly rare, 1%, and type O is 60% um, in the population, then you have um, um, two suspects, and one of them is determined to have a type uh, O. So the question is whether this observation is evidence against uh, this person or um, supports the hypothesis that uh, they um, should be investigated further. What, what, do, um, what do people think? What do you think? Sorry, can you speak up? Hello. Hello. Um, well, I, I, I think it gives, uh, it doesn't give too much information because most of the people is type O, so it, it could be or couldn't. Yes, I think uh, qualitatively you're right, but we will go over the quantitative derivation and it says that actually it is um, weak evidence towards the innocence of this person. So you can say, <clears throat> so that's the question. And uh, so we are going to compute um, the probabilities of various events and compare which of them is uh, likely. So one case, uh, one scenario is that the suspect and an unknown person are present there. Another um, uh, as prime hypothesis is that two unknown people from the population were present, not including the Oliver. And so then the probability of data that we have given the first scenario S is the probability that um, you get the, um, the other sample from an unknown person. And then the other hypothesis is that you have both um, um, the probability of um, the, the two blood types. So then we take the ratio of the two probabilities. Then it turns out that um, the, the ratio is the one over two probability of observing the all blood type, and that turns out to be 0.8. So um, roughly speaking, the, the data provides weak evidence against um, the supposition that Oliver was there. So it's kind of um, interesting, and uh, the quantitative application of our intuition of how we integrate information from various sources. So the information content of a variable is um, given, so if, if I have um, some variables are very rare and some variables are common. So if uh, I observe a variable that is very rare, then um, intuitively it should have, I gain more information about the underlying process uh, than I have, um, 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 than about the pro uh, event that is more common. So the, the definition that you probably heard is that it's um, um, log of one over P. And today we will discuss why this is actually up to the normalizing constant is the same, uh, the only function that can define information.
And I see there is a question in the chat. Um, no, it's uh, it's answered. So I will take care of the chat. Um, it's about uh, recording lectures. No, the question was about hyperbolic geometry. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, so somebody asked what is hyperbolic geometry, and I think I should answer, you know? Oh. Uh, From Colin? Ah, uh, maybe he sent it to you directly, so we didn't see the question. Okay. All right, so I will pause here, and uh, I will say that uh, um, ICTP is a great place to talk about hyperbolic geometry as you walk around, you will find lots of uh, uh, specialists on hyperbolic geometry. As you know, as you kind of walk around, we usually think that um, the world around us is Euclidean, uh, meaning that the parallel lines um, do not intersect and the distances are measured according to a standard Euclidean distance. So as you know, there were five axioms that using which Euclid formulated his geometry. So it turns out that you can eliminate one of them and still have a set of self-consistent um, observations. So that was the invention of uh, hyperbolic geometry. And it is a geometry that has negative curvature. And we will talk about why it is important for biological circuits. And also um, it's the geometry that describes our space time on large cosmological scales. And in the case of, you might be surprised to know that it actually describes also your perception of the world on uh, much more local uh, scales, although we didn't notice these distortions. But one of the one example of the distortion is um, that you might know that you know children, infants are born or babies, they try to grab a moon. They think that the moon is actually much closer to us visually than the real distance. And that's an example of the hyperbolic distortion in um, our perception of distances. So more about that will be in the later part of the course. Is that, is that okay? Did, um, I, I can't quite see uh, the person who and ask the question, um, but so, thank you. Colin, is that is that the, um, the the right name or is it the last name? Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm, thank you. So, <clears throat> so we will talk about uh, information content of a variable, and now if you have two independent random variables, then you can add information and uh, gather the total amount of information will be the sum of the two independent random variables. So, um, so here is a um, kind of a, another example of the information use. It's the submarine game. So how many of you, I, I played it as a child. How many of you have played it? You can raise your hand and we'll count it. Okay, very good, very popular. Doesn't take a lot of, um, um, can be played with minimal resources. So, and the question is, so each player hides a submarine on a square of an eight by eight grid. If a submarine, it, just one submarine, we will simplify the game. If the submarine is hit on the first guess, then you have reduced the uncertainty from um, the 64 bits, uh, 64 squares to, to one. So you gained in information a log two of 64, six bits of information. And then if um, the first shot is a miss, then the change in entropy is that um, we had 64 possibilities 
and then we have um, 63 remaining. So minus log of this amount, let's see. I'm trying to find my comment button, but here minus log 263 over 64, we, we gain just a tiny bit of uh, information by reducing the entropy. And then if the second shot is a miss, then we gain a little more um, and, and so on it continues. And then after 32 misses, you, 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 um, you start adding all of this information and uh, um, after a while, we uh, all of these give one bit. So in, in essence, we have reduced uncertainty from 64 um, possibilities to now we know it's 32. So it's roughly one half. And uh, uh, the total information content of all the outcomes is always um, uh, six bits, independent of how soon the submarine was discovered. So that's one example of how uh, information is progressing. But then another example that we will discuss maybe in more detail in subsequent lectures is that suppose that the probability of uh, finding the submarine is not uniform. So in this example, all squares had equal probability. But then imagine that um, you have some prior knowledge and uh, maybe you looked over, I, I don't know. And uh, so where the submarine is located. So in that case, the optimal solution is to order the squares in the order of how likely the submarine is there. And then go one by one in um, starting with the likeliest position. And then, what we will talk about a little bit in this lecture, but also in subsequent lectures, is that the average number of steps or guesses that it, um, that it takes to find the submarine, find the target, is indicative of the entropy of the underlying probability distribution. So, um, to take the extreme example, suppose you know for sure that it is um, located in um, one square. So then you will always find it with one step and the entropy is, um, um, the, the ent entropy is uh, zero, but also the, um, that's, that's one example. But the, when there is some uncertainty, the number of steps is actually bounded from below by the logarithm of, uh, by the exponent uh, e to the um, entropy of the distribution. So one can go back and forth between how long does it take to find something and the entropy underlying probability distribution and vice versa, the less knowledge we have about the target location, the longer it will take us to, um, to find the target. I would like to find my annotate button. So okay. I think it's okay now. Okay. <clears throat> so then another example of uh, maximal informative experiments, and it was actually proposed um, in, um, um, it has many applications um, for biological systems. So one example is we are given 12 weights, all equal in weight, except for one that is either heavier or lighter. So we are supposed to design a weighting scheme that will identify this weight as soon as possible with the smallest number um, of um, measurements. 
We have a, a two pen balance that has three outcomes. The combined weight is equal, heavier on the right or left. So we have a three bit, um, three outcome um, measurement device. So we need to design a strategy to find the odd weight and whether it is heavier or lighter than others using as few measurements as possible. So we are starting with 12 weights. So how would you proceed? That's a question for the audience. So we have a question uh, on the submarine on, in the chat. <clears throat> so in the chat, it says, um, so it would be a good strategy to change your estimated target if it took too long to hit the submarine. I, can you rephrase the question? Um, so, you know, identically it said um, it would be a good strategy to change our estimated target if it took too long to hit the submarine. So what I think another way of rephrasing this question is to say, I expect to find the submarine after this um, many hits and I haven't found it yet. So it means that my assumption about the probability distribution is wrong. So, and that's an important aspect of, um, of these um, questions because in many of the problems that, um, that you find in a textbook, it says, well, here's the probability of various events and what is the optimal strategy of uh, approaching this? But in real life, nobody's giving you these probabilities. They need to be estimated. So in other words, sometimes we have to make a move, not because it, um, it is um, kind of a maximum likelihood, not to the square that is, has the highest um, uh, probability, but to a square that will help us measure the overall probability distribution um, in the field. And um, so that would be an example of a search strategy, the infotaxis, that we will talk a little bit more in detail. But I think to rephrase the question, it would be saying that if it takes too long, then there must be something wrong in my model of the world. So maybe the probabilities that I assumed are wrong. And um, actually, you know, it's an example of the decision making that animals also do. Um, in one of my papers with collaborators, we studied how a little worm, C. elegans, makes decisions. And um, the, in that case, the C. elegans is just like with the submarine game. It's crawling around and its job is to find uh, a bacteria uh, that, that they eat. And, but they have to search an area which is a thousand times their body size. And the question is in a simplified experimental situation, the animal is living on a plate that is full of food, full of bacteria. And maybe these are even dead bacteria such that they do not move. So it's a prepackaged food, if you will, for, for C. elegans. And they're crawling around eating it. And then they're being picked up with a, uh, with a pick and put on a new plate when there is no food. So, um, I'm not quite prepared with the slides. I will just tell you a story now and the slides will be later on the next lecture. Is that what happens is that the animal will search the area where they have been dropped off. They actually, they will crawl a little bit from where they've been dropped off in the estimate of how much they were moved. And then they will search this area for a while, for some time, and then they will give up and then start going um, somewhere else. So it turns out that this type of decision-making can actually be formulated 
in this infotaxis like uh, trajectory by um, where the animal is exploring the most likely possibility but if it is not finding any food where it's supposed to find supposed to have found food then it must mean that the model of the world is wrong and so he says well um, it's time to move to uh, somewhere else and you can think of how this is an example of uh, decision making in humans so i'm working on a research problem i expect to find a solution but after a while, if the solution is not found, um, I will say, well, maybe it's time to switch to another problem. And, um, you know, and, and so on with um, other everyday tasks. Is that, thank you for your question. Is that, is that good? Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, you know, it's important. I appreciate very much your questions because we, we, we should be as in, you know make more effort to be interactive given that I am um, on zoom um, and uh, so please uh, um, ask questions as uh, um, I heard Bill Balik once say that it's important to more important to uncover a little than cover a lot so we don't want to cover a lot of material but not answer um, uh, questions so, um, so this is an example of maximally informative experiments, and it 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 is very has a lot of applications. This is a kind of a baby example that we will talk about, but it also has um, almost applications. So, if any one of you have to read, um, have to apply for a research grant, and um, what uh, reviewers like to see is that you formulate two alternative hypotheses about the subject that you're studying, and then you will eliminate one of them. So you can think about that actually this is a maximally informative way of studying that particular question, because you're setting up your hypothesis as two equal al alternatives. We don't want to be testing alternatives where one is most likely false, and we are just fine tuning the other alternatives. So you would like to, in a maximally informative experiment, to set up alternatives that are equally likely. And then you will do an experiment and you eliminate half of the possibilities. And so per experiment, that's maximally informative. So now we see this um, in the synthetic situation with these weights. So at each strategy, um, our um, strategy is to set up the uh, possibilities such that they are equally likely. And um, let's see. So, for example, um, we have our 12 weights and uh, we have possibilities. Either one weight is heavier or lighter, two, second weight heavier or lighter, or third weight heavier or lighter, and so on. So we have 12 weights. <laughs> so suppose we will weigh not, um, not all weights, but um, uh, four of them versus another four. So we have a possibility that if uh, one of them is heavier, then it means that it could be one, two, three, four that is heavy, or five, six, seven that is lighter. Or it could be that one, two, three, four is lighter, and five, six, seven is heavier. Or <coughs> it could be that um, uh, if they're equal, it means that um, these two will be um, will show equal weight, and then we know that um, the altered weight is somewhere in the set that was not tested. So then, in other words, so if we're in this hypothesis in, in this track, then um, 
you have um, um, eight possibilities and I would now I can take three <clears throat> uh, three weights and um, if uh, one of them is uh, positive then it's either one two um, maybe or five is negative and, and so on so we have now various three possibilities and um, with another, so with um, basically three measurements, you will be able to um, see uh, and identify the um, malfunctioning weight. So I'll give you a few minutes to look at the table here to go over various possibilities. Is this the, it should be. Sorry, Tanya, is this the unique best strategy in this case? Uh, is this a unique strategy? No, uh, if it is unique, are there different strategies that uh, solve this problem? Uh, or are there strategies that solve this problem better? I mean, is this maximally informative? Should be. So we'll do a computation, I think. So let's think about, um, um, yeah, I think it should be maximally informative. So let's see, uh, let's see what is, um, you see how we set up here, this weight here? Um, two of the positive and one negative, right? So if it weighs positive, we have eliminated that it's not, the six is not a minus and it could be uh, all, all, like one or two. So here, these are not fractions, okay? Uh. <laughs> um, these are the weighting things. So if you weight, you know, like in this possibility, one plus and two plus and five minus. So if they're equal, so that's the third, um, the third possibility, then it means that it was five minus. Okay, so we can now compute. Oh, I guess I, I don't, I don't, I don't have a computation. So the claim is that um, in each stage we have set up to um, to maximize information between. Um, so we can think about what is the entropy here. The entropy is uh, twenty four, right? Okay, so we have a question, but I don't know whether it is um, about this one or about the submarine case. The question from Edward said, I don't really understand how the second loop works. Um, you mean this loop over here? Um, this loop over here? Do, do you see my cursor? Let's see. So let's see here. Um, you don't want to set up, so um, I guess the, the, um, the question is about this part. So we have determined that the weight can be in um, um, 
one, uh, so we can have uh, weights one through four can be overweight and five through eight can be uh, underweight. So then we make a combination between two positive and one negative versus another two positive and another negative. So if we have, if they're all equal, it means that um, it's either seven or eight. And then this is our, um, our possibilities. And here you don't want to uh, select seven versus eight because then you will not know, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, you will not know, I guess you will know one of them. So you couldn't do one over um, seven versus eight, but in other ways you can take another weight, one over seven. Okay, so then, um, so the question was answered, or I think is it maybe it will be helpful to go through the explanation uh, for other people? Mm. Okay, so Edward said uh, it's okay. I think you need some time to think uh, through this example. And, uh, but Edward is fine. Any other uh, question on this? Uh, there is another question from Gianluca. Uh, we had three possible outcomes and started dividing the groups in three parts. Uh, is this a general rule? Yes, it's an you know it's an approximation to uh, to the to the general rule. So we would like to um, set up. Um, Um, so with one measurement, if we had two alternatives, you will, uh, you can learn one bit of information. If you have three alternatives, so you can do log of three base two. So uh, we would like to set up into these three equal distant uh, opportunities. So that's uh, the the, the probabilities are approximately equal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if we had a two, then the setup would be different if we didn't know whether it would be, um, yes. But, but with waiting, you always know one of them is less, the other one is more. So you, you are taking advantage of this um, waiting experiment. So now, with maximal informative experiment to generalize this to, um, there is a series of papers uh, starting with um, David McKay and others called maximal informative experiments. And they say, they go roughly like this, that you have some model about what a neuron does and you have some unknown parameters in, in your model. You can ask, <coughs> What stimuli should I use that will reduce my uncertainty in these parameters most? And so, um, and um, so that's the the main idea of these maximally informative experiments. They have a disadvantage in practice because. Um, biological systems adapt. So if you had a static system whose parameters were not changing, then this idea of maximally informative experiments um, would be a great one. But because the parameters of the neuron could change depending on which stimuli we use, as in adaptation, in that case, <clears throat> It sometimes can set up a cycle where we are chasing a moving target, where the parameters change as a function of um, what stimuli are being shown to the um, to the animal. So, but assuming you know, imagine that in this case, this extra weight was hopping. 
So then it will be a more complicated uh, scenario where you're trying to make measurements, but the, the extra weight um, is uh, playing hide and seek. So you're, you're making one measurement and then it jumps around depending on what measurements. And so kind of a, a theory of games. So then it becomes uh, um, more interesting and complicated um, very fairly quickly. So um, going back to this example with infotaxes, Sometimes uh, this is just a point of discussion to um, to provide a counter argument. Mm -hmm. You can set up situations where, uh, for example, going back to the Saint Marine game, you know perfectly well where it is, but in real life you can't get to it before it changes its position. So you can have perfect information about its location. But in terms of, um, you know, actually getting that submarine or getting that fish or getting that prey, um, it, that, that doesn't always translate into uh, gathering the reward. So then uh, we are entering the regime of uh, predictive coding and predictive information. So just like you can compute information about the current position, you can also compute information about the future position, and um, and you know, and and then it um, um, becomes a more interesting computational problem. But one can still use um, these ideas to maximize information, assuming that there is a time lag between knowledge and and response. Okay, so we have. Lots of questions in the chat. <coughs> I tried to address it by repeating what you said before. It's about why do you choose uh, uh, one, two, and uh, one and two in the in the second uh, weighting uh, instead of one and five. Let's see. see. Mm -hmm. So I hope, uh, Jitender, is it okay? Yes, so okay. one, yeah. Okay, Jitendi is fine. Okay, thank you. You can go ahead. Okay. So um, then one of the definitions of um, entropy is, um, you know, how rich is the source? So especially during lectures, I try to use this example. So suppose you ask me questions and no matter what you ask, I say yes. So it's obvious that in that case, I'm not conveying any information because my entropy is zero. Same thing goes for neurons. So as you, how many of you are experimentalists? Do we have any hands raised for experimentalists? I can't quite see. No, I think uh, no, no experimentalist, at least uh, here, maybe we have some okay. experimentalists online. Uh, but okay, so then I will tell you about neurons. But this is my, I did some experiments, so I'll, I'll tell you my theory experiment view of neurons. So as you know, neuron is a cell and um, it responds with kind of zero or one. One means it produces a spike. Spikes are costly. So imagine a dead neuron. No matter what you send the signal to it, it's not sending anything out. So that neuron conveys zero information because his entropy is zero. Now, before the neuron dies, sometimes if you're recording, um, you, so you put an electrode next to a neuron, and when it is a healthy neuron, we will show you an example of recording. It goes between, you know, sometimes it spikes, sometimes it doesn't. And then just, but just before it goes, um, uh, it dies, it will produce lots of lots of spikes. That's often the, the signature of a dying neuron. So in that case, it is also not producing any information because it constantly says one, no matter what the input is. Okay. And uh, one example um, 
uh, from um, hearing is uh, on occasion, one can hear a very um, frequency defined noise in the ear and then it goes away. So unfortunately, what it means is that sometimes some of our um, kind of um, cells in the ear, they have a very complicated uh, mechanical sensors, uh, um, complicated, very complicated physics and mechanics to <coughs> sense vibrations. And when um, these cells die, they cannot be regenerated. So that's all the argument about hearing loss and not hearing at large volumes because they're use dependent. So when this cell dies, it will produce a lot of spikes. And then the person hears a frequency that corresponds to that neuron. So that's, that's not a very pleasant, but uh, you know, happens. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of the information content, but then let's do a variation on this theme. So you're asking me questions and now I'm saying yes and no, and then you can get more sophisticated and you can ask me the same question. And sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I say no to the same question. So I have the capacity of conveying information because the entropy of my answers is non-zero, there is variable, sometimes zero, sometimes one. But then what is interesting is when you specify your input, specify the question, and if the entropy of my answers equals to the entropy of my answers to all kinds of different questions, then no information has been conveyed. So in that case, the neuron is still alive. It does zero and one, but maybe it's disconnected from the input. So then the information will again be zero. So I hope uh, um, this um, um, provides you some examples of a practical use of information. Yes, go ahead. I hear there is some question, no? Uh, questions? Oh, I think uh, we are all with you. Okay. All right, so now we all know that uh, the definition of entropy in physics and um, I like to find my, we found it during test, the, the, the annotate button. Well, I, I I will have to do with uh, comments in um, in PDF, I think. <clears throat> so in physics, in physics, the entropy it's not as nice as it is, is logarithm of the number of possibilities. So now um, you can write this as um, logarithm, the probability of various events, one over N. And um, I will do a minus. And then I can also write this as a sum from one, one over n of my possibilities, one over n log one over n. So that works out to be, I didn't lose any signs here. Um, yes, yeah, so this is minus sum over i pi log pi. So that's the definition of entropy that when we are talking about gas and volumes of a, a particle. But here's another definition here that is uh, more nuanced and um, 
talks about various possibilities that are not equal. So that's an example of a generalization of um, information uh, and entropy. So now this is actually the same thing as this equation, because instead of probability of i, we write one over p of i. So now looking at this equation, you can see this is information of one variable i, of one outcome i, and then the source produces these possibilities. So we just average and sum over the possi um, various possibilities. So the entropy content of a source means that we have entropy for a given outcome, which as I have drawn in the past, goes like this. So when P is large, it approaches, um, should, be, should go to zero. <laughs> and then when P is small, it should be large. And so that's another definition of the entropy of a source. And um, you can think, and then we, we talked about that information is a change in entropy. So if you learn everything about um, the state of the source at any given time, then you reduce the entropy to zero. Okay. <clears throat> so any, are there any questions? Does that, is that similar to what you just covered earlier in the, earlier today? Well, I think what we did was a little bit more uh, theoretical with less examples. Okay. So I think this complements uh, what we have done. It gives okay. more intuition on... Uh, okay. Uh, All right. So then we talk about... So maybe this will be the, the more theoretical part. We will, um, we will see whether... And we can go faster. So this is the famous Shannon paper. If you haven't read it, I recommend that you read it. It's um, a little bit difficult to get over the first uh, few pages because the language is a little bit old uh, and the terminology about uh, telegrams and teletypes and things like this. So I found it a little bit difficult to get over the first few pages, but then um, um, it, it is very interesting and informative. And um, so in his uh, paper, he derives uh, a theorem that entropy is the unique measure of available <coughs> information consistent with three postulates. So um, also in that paper, uh, in rules with going with examples, I would like to ask you uh, if you talked about um, information, what is what do you think is the difference between uh, information or relationship between information and crossword puzzles? Information and crossword uh, crossword puzzles. Uh, uh, crossword puzzle. And then uh, there is another hint. Why is crossword puzzles are usually in 2D and not in 3D? You can imagine um, having, you know, the world, uh, you know, having a kind of a 3D structure and they gave you clues, uh, you know, vertical, left, and then in depth. Uh -huh. So we have uh, Nicolò says that each word you guess right, uh, you gain information on other words. Yes, <clears throat> right. So that's that's the right um, the right. Um, um, but it turns out so the full answer is in the Shannon's paper. <clears throat> so he was very interested in uh, sending um, code messages. So it's um, kind of a World War II communication problem and how they can be compressed. So he studied language 
and he studied correlation between um, words in um, um, and syllables in the language. So it turns out that the if there were no correlations, so between the words, uh, meaning that if you know one word, one letter E, if you couldn't predict if the probability of an, having the next letter N here would be equally likely with all the other um, letters, then it would be very hard to, basically impossible to solve a crossword puzzle because there are not enough correlations between the variables to, um, you know, to, to help you out. But if the words were too correlated, meaning once you know one letter, you basically know the whole world, um, the whole word, then it's not possible. It will not be possible to construct a cross-world puzzle. So it turns out that the correlations in the uh, language are just strong enough to allow for um, some room for variation um, for generating crossword puzzles. But then in 3D, there are too many constraints and that becomes not feasible. So, and then further details you can um, read about in the Shannon's uh, paper. Okay. So, um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a long paper and um, it has many things in it, <laughs> not just crossword puzzles. Um, so then um, he said, we have three axioms that this function um, so you, you can stop me and we can go faster if that's something that you discussed, but I think it also provides a link to hyperbolic geometry and hierarchical systems. So we can um, go through and then um, um, go faster if you already heard it. So there are three, ex um, three properties that we would like to have an expression for the entropy as a function of probabilities. And um, we would like it to be monotonic, meaning that as more measurements are made, the information should increase and not decrease. For independent measurements, the entropy should add. And then for branching process, this, is, this will be a connection with hyperbolic geometry, the total information should be a weighted sum of information gained at each branch. So did you go through the derivation of the Shannon's entropy? Uh, no, we didn't do, uh, we didn't go through this this morning. Okay. And maybe- Okay, so, all right. So we, um, we so then um, it, it's useful to go because um, um, it's an example of the hierarchical system and uh, um, and so we'll relate to later on to hyperbolic geometry. So we will talk, suppose you have um, constructed um, your questions and um, you ask the question, you get an answer A or B. And then once you got A, <clears throat> then you um, get another question or measurement and you had possibilities A1, A2, A3, or B1 and B2. So uh, information must be a function of how many questions you have asked, because this is the number of measurements. And let's consider the case where the number of um, um, possibilities is K to the M, so kind of a hierarchical process. So our answer is composed of M independent parts here, one or two, and each part has uh, K equal likely possibilities. So, um, so not two and three, but uh, for now it will be uniform. So, <clears throat> so um, um, maybe I skipped some slides, but, um, 
just a second. Maybe maybe my slides got rearranged a little bit. Is is it um do we, do you want a break or not? I can find my slides. Or we are going nonstop. Um I uh, as you want, I think uh, we were supposed to stop at uh, half past five. So in twenty half past five means uh, well, uh, twenty five minutes from now. Means uh, half I past see. eight probably in your place. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, let me. Um, um, Maybe we can uh, post. No, it's uh, okay. So then, um, wh what we have is that. Um, um, <clears throat> so because we have independent measurements. So it's okay, we will, I think the slides are okay. I can, there is this joke in, in, in the old days, you know, a person arrives with slides and just before they talk, they all fall and mix up and this is now what do I do now? So just put them in random order and I will, I will go with this. So I will go with these slides as they are. So what we have is um, remember that our, um, Assumption was independence. For independent measurements, the entropy should be additive. So um, in other words, that if we have um, K, um, Km possibilities, it's, it's the same thing. So this function of the entropy has to be um, M times the function of one measurement. We have a question. Um, oh. So uh, I guess uh, there's a delay between the chat and my answers. So in the crossword, you can have more or less black squares. Oh, this is me. I'm trying to yes, argue, I mean, discuss this question uh, with okay. Jitendra about the density. She says, uh, uh, what if you change the density of words? And uh, in a crosswords, I, I guess you can add uh, these black squares. Right. And I think it's an interesting question to ask whether uh, the crossword will become simpler or uh, more complex uh, if you have more or less of these black squares. Yes, and I think also different languages are, you know, have different statistics. So you can uh, look at the average density of these um, uh, empty squares for crosswords in different languages. And uh, another example uh, of a recent paper, it's um, a theory of, say, human communication. So they measured um, the, how much information is conveyed per syllable and uh, how fast the syllables are being pronounced. So it turns out Italian was one of the languages that they studied. So they found was that there is a more correlation, but people speak faster do, than um, compared to they say in the Japanese language where the information, con syllables are more independent, but people speak slowly. What, 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 do, what does everybody think? Does that sound reasonable? No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then uh, we can get to you. What? Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, I, I was asking correlations between what? Between different words spoken? Or between different syllables. Okay, thanks. Okay, so with the understanding that there is a certain rate of information with which human brain can absorb, and then either you can speak faster, but figure out from correlations what was said, or if every bit is independent, then you have to speak slowly. Okay, so this is a, a, a digression to um, hopefully entertain. So we found that information has to satisfy. So the reason for this is that we ask independent questions and the answer must add. So the function um, 
Um, therefore, um, as a result, we have M times F of K because this is the amount of information we, um, we get. And um, um, that's the kind of independence and additivity problem. So consider a pair of integers now, L and N. So we don't know what this function um, is, but we are going to bound it by um, kind of asymptotic series. So we, we look for two integers and um, such that this is in between k to the power of m and k to the power m plus one. So information has to be a monotonic function of n. So therefore, um, if um, um, th this has to be less than that, and so, um, and also when we apply um, f, this unknown function, to our number of measurements, so that if we have the relationship that km is less than ln is less than km plus one, then the same thing will be true when we apply this function f. So then by our additivity property here, we convert this to m equals f of k, n equals f of l, and m plus one on times f of k. So this is just the restatement from the previous slide. And now we divide by n. So we have m over n, and we also divide by f of k. So we have f of l divided by f of k, and then m plus one over n. So uh, from the properties of these integers, um, which we said that came to the M is, um, L to the N is in between uh, two subsequent powers of K. We know that uh, if we take the logarithm of both sides, M log K is N is log L and M plus one is log K. <laughs> so now we have two uh, inequalities that are very similar to each other. And you go to the limit of large N. And so the difference between the ratio of our two unknown functions and the ratio of the logarithms is, um, uh, has to be zero because these uh, two functions, they bracket each other. Um, you can subtract one from the other. So it's zero here. This is our absolute value. And then this is one over n. So one over n becomes um, epsilon. So in other words, there's really no chance um, for this function to be anything else than the logarithm. So that's a nice example uh, in Shannon's paper of how you start with three reasonable assumptions, monotonic, independent, um, and uh, what was it? Monotonic, independent, and um, additive, I think. Yes, uh, monotonic independence and the branching process. Then um, starting with these assumptions, the only function for the entropy that satisfies this has to be the entropy. And yeah, so that's the definition why the um, you, you, can, you can change a constant, so it can be log base, uh, different bases, but um, there is no other choice um, as to having it be a logarithm of n. So when it is equal probability, the information has to be proportional to log n. And to find the expression for unequal probabilities, we consider the case of rational probability. So we approximate this as um, um, Kn over some of the possibilities. And um, we consider the total um, number of possible answers grouped into these n groups. So think about this um, <clears throat> case of with the hierarchical assumption where <clears throat> These are the number of possibilities. And these are all equally likely, but the P1 and P2 and P3, and at this level, they're not equally likely. Um, 
<clears throat> so um, we look, uh, so we know the answer I, I derived for you uh, intuitively what should be the form of the answer, but this is a quantitative definition. First, we need to find which of the N groups um, the answer belongs to. So uh, which of these groups and uh, we denote this is information as a function of PN, which is what we are after. <clears throat> and at the second stage, if we know that we are in, for example, this group, the information is um, log two of this number, because I have narrowed down out of all possibilities to the remaining uncertainty. So if I know exactly full information into which of these possibilities we fall into, then um, the enter, the, we will learn full information. But if we only know the group, then we um, our uncertainty is still remains is log two of Kn. And so because each group occurs with probability Pn, the average information we gain in the second step, let's see is um, Pn times I of N or our um, a formula which we had in the past. <clears throat> so, and then the total information that is gained across the two steps has to equal the number of these possibilities, which is N total. <clears throat> and so information at the first step is um, this is information in the second step and the total information. So um, if you subtract one from the other, then you get this um, famous equation for the uh, information or the total entropy of the source. So any questions about this definition derivation? Okay, so no, we I think uh, we are uh, all fine. Also online, uh, there is no question. No okay, so okay, so now um, now we can come back to hyperbolic geometry and explore the relationship between information and hyperbolic geometry. So if you look at this type of network and um, so <clears throat> And I'm asking you to compute a distance between um, sorry, I have pointer issues. And I'm asking you to compute the distance between this node here and this node. How would you do it? So, you know, let's forget about information theory for a moment. I just have a hierarchical network. How do you compute a distance between these two nodes? Hello? Hello? It's a question. I, I think it's a question, no, for the students. Yes, it is a question for the audience. Yes. How do you define the distance? Well, I mean, that, that, that's also the question to you. So um, you, you have, uh, you know, I gave you this graph. How would you define a distance? A longer graph. Like the minimum number of steps to go from one node to the other? Yes, right, so the minimal number of steps you can say you, you draw it here, one, two, three, four, okay? So uh, you know how, and then, then this, the, from here, uh, I don't want to use a different color because um, I guess it doesn't have, or you know, between this point 
and this point. So we go like this, a little trajectory. Or within the cluster, you have a little trajectory. So that's our graph distance. So now here comes the hyperbolic geometry. Imagine that you have a hierarchical network like that, but you know maybe there is uncertainty in the positions of these nodes and you would like the distance um, to capture the distance along this tree. Then it turns out that the distance, the optimal kind of continuous approximation to this between two points will go something like this. That's the optimal trajectory or the path of the shortest distance, the geodesic one. So in this case, it turns out, um, you notice that the trajectory is the minimal distance trajectory is curved. It's not, um, doesn't go this way. So whenever you have a hierarchical process, underneath and you would like to have a distance that somehow captures that underlying hierarchy, then um, often the hyperbolic geometry arises as a natural continuous approximation to this underlying hierarchical uh, structure. So this is a, a qualitative statement. And a more quantitative statement is that um, the, the, uh, there are various approximations to the hyperbolic space, and one of them is this Poincaré half plane, which um, um, in, in which case trajectories do indeed go kind of this way. Um. And okay, so we have lots of questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so in the chat. Uh... Uh, yes, no, I mean, uh, lots of answers. Uh, 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 Gianluca Serra says that uh, he would count the number of jumps uh, in yes. order to define the distance. So, but uh, say, I have a question. So, uh, does this uh, hyper uh, hyperbolic geometry has to do with the number of uh, nodes uh, that you have at a certain distance with the distribution of points? So imagine that you have yes. uh, uniformly distributed points uh, in a space. Uh, yes, yes. And then uh, you ask, you start from one point and you ask how many points uh, are at the distance uh, D. And then we know that, uh, say, say, in Euclidean geometry, this goes as R to the D. Yes. And uh, okay. how does it go in uh, hyperbolic geometry? So it also goes... Um, it goes exponentially. Okay. So it goes as e to the r and then dimensionality. Uh -huh. But what is also interesting um, in, in units of curvature, so a curvature goes here. So radius is kind of measures. We need d is the dimension of the space. And R is, has to be a dimensionless quantity. So R is measured in units of curvature. So an example on this slide is useful because the curvature here will not be uniform. So for it to be uniform, I sort of need the equal branching ratios everywhere. So the curvature here will be larger here and here than here. So, um, I think a good model of hyperbolic space is um, cauliflower or broccoli. Yeah. You know, how, how it grows and sometimes, um, you know, it, overall it grows uniformly, but, um, you know, there are, you can imagine that it can grow, um, you, you know, if there are some adverse conditions, then it will grow towards and have um, um, more data um, in, in certain direction. So um, this is also the model of um, how um, we talk about 
um, allocating possibilities towards, you, you know, um, imagine that the states are under our control and we can define categorization variables. When does it make sense to split one um, category such as this one into uh, five or just two and or how many categories should I assign to? So that's a question that is related to the information that is related to the source. So one example from my own um, life. So when I was transitioning from physics to neuroscience, I had one folder in my um, kind of, a, we had a paper uh, at those times, papers were printed out. So I had one um, binder and it said neurons. So <laughs> all of my neuroscience paper would fit into one um, kind of one concept. And then as you know more or learn more about neuroscience, then you start sorting into visual neurons or auditory neuroscience or um, general principles of coding and so on. And the same thing is when a child is learning a language. So they first learn one concept, animal, and then it will be cats and dogs and then the subdivisions and so on. So there is a, with experience, um, how do you form an appropriate tree? So that relates to the information content of the source. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, okay. The dimension is related to the number of branches? Now that's it. Um, um, so as you see, uh, on this slide, I guess the notes, maybe this notes, they're still here. It is um, a, a tricky question. So on one case, dimension can represent the num uh, the branching factor. And that's, I think, the most reasonable hypothesis. But if you just look at the growth of the states with the distance, then it confines the dimensionality and say radius um, when, and, and curvature. So um, I would say that dimension is more closely approximated with the branching factor. And, uh, um, but, um, if we just look at the asymptotical expansion of distances with um, radius, then the curvature of the space and the dimensionality on the branching ratio you know, are confounded. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you for the question. So, um, the last concept for today um, is. Um, if we are stopping at um, just about now, right? Or, uh, yes, yes. Or do you want me to go for 15 more minutes? So I wasn't sure. Uh, um, no, well, I think, uh, well, by the way, uh, I think we already went uh, on the asymptotic equipartition property. Uh, okay, so the then market. you know, um, then um, I think you, that's uh, then. Um, then, then, then you can tell me just so, so I, I think it's kind of a magical, a magical property because it's the number of uh, that, you, you know, you have the probability distribution and you can approximate it as a constant and then a zero. And, you know, the entropy is the number of these likely possibilities. So if you, if you went through this, then we can stop here and we will go to conclusions. Okay, so we have a couple of questions on the on the on the chat. So I think uh, uh, the first question I wouldn't mind repeating the topic uh, though. So of course I think uh, we are going to talk. Uh, much more about hyperbolic geometry, uh, right, uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
And then uh, the second question is, does hyperbolic geometry is an optimized way of uh, dealing with the distance? I mean, is it equivalent to Euclidean geometry or we just can't uh, do the work with Euclidean geometry? So, <clears throat> um, well, I think your point is that uh, it's uh, it's the outcome of an optimization principle, right? So the 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 way in which uh, say topics, uh, I mean, in your example of folders uh, of neuroscience, uh, so the way in which these are organized is the outcome of uh, an optimization principle, and it turns out to obey this. Uh, hyperbolic geometry. I mean, this is what I yes. gather from this, say, informal uh, introduction to this general topic. Y yes. Th thank you, Matteo. Um, ah, okay. Valerie Engelmeyer uh, said uh, he, she wouldn't uh, mind repeating uh, the definition of uh, typical sets. So maybe we can take five more minutes uh, if you all agree. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, on. just a different person's perspective on, uh, on the typical sets. So um, um, so roughly, you know, in this figure, we have, these are the sets of possibilities. You have lots of possibilities and so basically if you think that I have a probability distribution and it is uh, more like a Gaussian so um, it goes up here and, and goes down so I will just approximate this Gaussian as a zero and then a constant and then another zero so then it says that because this is the entropy and these are all equally likely, so uh, they're equally likely, the log n of these, uh, the size of these possibilities, so the typical set has this many elements, two to the n um, times the entropy. So this is the number of elements. If I take log two um, of this number, I get n times the entropy per, um, per variable. So the entropy determines how many um, points are within the likely scenario. And then you have um, a logarithmic number of points that are unlikely. So for the most part, we can ignore them. So, for example, you know, they ask, sometimes people ask, I went to the doctor, I did this test, and they tell me the probability of disorder is P to the minus, uh, 10 to the minus um, 7. So, what does it mean? It means you don't have it. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, but that's not what they can tell you. So, if, um, um, you know, for all effective purposes, you, um, you have some possibilities that are likely and the size of these possibilities that are equally likely is the entropy. So the entropy determines the, um, the size of these equally likely um, possibilities. In other words, I, I'm ignoring the variations in the probability between these, uh, between these points. I hope this was uh, qualitatively helpful. Yeah, so I think I will put uh, the chapter three of Cover and Thomas uh, that discusses uh, asymptotic equipartition property on uh, Slack so that uh, whoever has problems with it uh, can, grow, can go through it. Uh, can go, yeah. yeah, I think this is from Cover and Thomas, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so um, um, I guess you, you can send me comments by email or Slack and wishes uh, for the next um, lecture. And I, I guess I, I will see you all on Wednesday. Is that, okay. is that 
Is that right? Um, is that the right um, um, time frame for the lecture? Yes, yes. So next lecture will be on uh, Wednesday at the uh, same time. Okay. Thank yeah, you very thank much, you. Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Be well. Be Bye. well. Bye. Bye. Okay.